Whatever you want. Whatever you want. Awesome. You gave the phone to the wrong person. Did I? Yeah. Should I give it to you? Uh, how can I turn these off? These lights you can't turn. I think that's No, slow. those I can? No. Okay. Well, I'll get started. I find this a fascinating topic. Uh, longevity, of course, in a particular means uh, length of life. And uh, I've been watching this literature, and I'm interested in a certain aspect of the, the research literature for a number of years. I actually have a friend who's involved in this, uh, at NIH, in this, uh, in this uh, topic. And what I'm going to talk about is um, the science, the history of the science, what people think about longevity, why we age, and then talk about um, what is known about studying from the from the molecular to the epidemiologic and anthropologic aspects, what makes a difference? What about people living less and people living longer? That's been looked at very carefully. <coughs> and I can tell you there's a huge database and huge literature. Can you hear me? On longevity. And so now is the right time to look at this information. You can Google and get everything you want and find out tons of stuff. There are a couple of interesting books to read. <clears throat> but the punchline is this. <coughs> the punchline, which is really cool, is can you yourself modify your longevity? What do you think the answer to that is? Yes. Yes. Yes, yes. absolutely. Of course there are genetic factors, and they're extremely important. You individually, <coughs> without spending a pile of money, can modify your longevity in, well, you can modify it either way, right? But presumably in the positive direction so that you live longer. <clears throat> I'm not saying anything about what we do now, which is traditional, which is very important. Get a doctor, get your physical exams, get your screening lab, do the traditional routine things. Those things are very important, right? That's traditional medicine. I'm talking about other than that. So does it make sense to maybe take some supplements, change lifestyle, you know, when you're approaching your 40s, 50s, 60s, and not go to the doctor and do appropriate things? No, that doesn't make any sense. Do the traditional thing. Take care of yourself. We're going to talk about the other stuff. There are a lot of slides, so I'm going to move pretty quickly. Please uh, holler, interrupt, whatever you want. Somebody yell at me what if I'm getting, uh, you know, close to time. I don't know what is time. I mean, you're all like... Don't have to rush off to a something or other, do you? Or maybe you do. <coughs> anyway, here we go. Oh, maybe not. This doesn't work. Do you want to take a little drive in there and not the handle of it that goes and plugs into the computer? Okay, well, look, I can do this for the time being. Did you put that. Um, batteries? Yeah, we put new batteries in. Uh, uh, there is a uh, USB. So this is, it's interesting, but if you choose to take advantage of the information, it's useful. <coughs> if you just want to sit there and punch the thing, I'll use the pointer and just hit the space bar and it'll go to the next slide. So next slide, please. Or I can do it. <coughs> So, <coughs> this name, this is aging gracefully, don't you think? Depends this on is, how old she is. This is not Leonard Hayflick, okay? But <laughs> Leonard Hayflick, I actually met Leonard Hayflick once, years ago when I was a fellow at the NIH. He's a Nobel laureate, and he got the Nobel Prize for writing things, but related to this. Leonard Hayflick is dead now, but he's the god of this whole science of what's really going on behind why we age and how long we live. And he was a very interesting guy. <clears throat> so I'm going to talk a fair amount about him because he, he developed a, a number of concepts and, and is a big reason why we understand it as well as we do. And he said entropy, entropy we know is when you don't prepare and take care of entropies, random things falling apart, right? If you take your car <clears throat> and you never repair it, never get the oil changed and you're driving around, gradually entropy will cause things to unravel and it'll fall apart. You've seen those what-if movies where if you take downtown Boston, 
and suddenly the people leave and you don't do anything else, you don't fix the buildings. Have you seen those store pictures? Pretty soon the buildings are crumbling, they're falling apart, everything's growing up, there are wild animals all over the place, there are floods, chaos, entropy, it's a physics term, but it means when you're not paying attention, the way things just randomly progress, and it's chaos. It's basically random chaos. So chaos, entropy, or falling apart explains aging. So if I get older, whatever's happened to me, it's kind of random things happening, you know, uh, UV damage, uh, mutations, uh, auto accidents. <coughs> Genetic determinism explains longevity. So what's your, in your genes explains how long you're going to live. Now, that's the earliest statement by Leonard Hayflick. That's what he believed. It's not quite like that. That's part of it, right? So he says entropy explains aging. These things that randomly happen to us, you know, like eating too many fats or whatever it is, and then they're the wrong kinds and getting heart disease or getting in an accident or getting skin cancer from UV damage. And genetic determinism explains longevity. And then he jokes around. He was kind of a sarcastic guy. And undefined terminology explains misunderstanding both. Like everything else in life, right? Oh, can I have the next one? Please? So just to, I'm not talking much about history. I mean, here's Ponce de Leon. Who isn't interested in living longer? Who hasn't been, what every culture has been looking, well, most of the developed cultures have been looking for the fountain of youth for a long time. You know, for a while we thought it was in St. Augustine, Florida. Some people still do. There's water there. The Persians had their own version of things. Uh, and I think this is a Greek uh, ramification. But the search for the fountain of youth is big time. Next, next slide. And <coughs> so Leonard Hayflick, uh, important to know about this, guy, born in 1928, PhD, University of Pennsylvania. And here's what he really did. In 1962, that's a long time ago. I mean, the only guy that was alive then was like Dr. Holland. So. <laughs> In 1962, Hayflick defined the Hayflick limit. And what did he say? He said that when you have biological cells, like human cells, they will divide, 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 like ours do all the time. But they have a limit, and that's the Hayflick limit. And it's programmed into the genes. They're going to divide X number of times, and then they're going to stop dividing. And then what happens? Well, you're going to crap out and die. Okay. So it said genetically, you only have a certain lifespan. Now, that was different than Alexis Carroll, who's another physiologist scientist. Before that, Alexis Carroll, one of the fathers of, uh, of cellular immunology and biology, said, well, it looks like these cells just keep dividing. They just divide and divide and divide and divide. So if you take cells, you give them enough food and a good environment, not too much crowding, they will continue dividing. <coughs> Hayflick, I mean, uh, Leonard said, no. So this is where we begin to look into longevity, how long you're going to live, and stuff like this. And then, let's look at this concept. This makes kind of sense between this and this. What we're talking about, kind of modern term, is that normal human cells are mortal. There is somewhat of a Hayflick limit. There is a certain amount of division that will go on, and then it becomes less effective. What happens with cancer cells? They don't have any Hayflick limit, do they? They just divide like men. So they're controlled cells, and they're uncontrolled cells. And obviously, in oncology research, they're looking into this very heavily. So he's considered the father of gerontology and aging studies. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about his thoughts. Now, what he favored, uh, what he favored was the program theory of aging and longevity. He said, Mother Nature, or God, or Gaia, or whoever you want to pick, or evolution, Fixed it so that you're going to live not more than this period of time. Because you've got to make room for your kids and your grandkids. You've got to allow for genetic mixing to keep the species robust so we don't go extinct, right? So he said it's programmed. It's going to go to this point and then not much beyond. That was the first concept of aging. Next slide, please. <coughs> so, you know, we all know this biology. You know, inner pro, meta, anatella, I mean, the cell divides, and then these cells divide again. Well, He's saying, how many times can this scenario below happen? And it's, there is a certain amount of programming that it's going to be limited with certain cell lines. So that is, in fact, there is a fact that certain cells, mammalian cells, are not going to divide forever. But it's modifiable. Next slide, please. 
So now, uh, just a couple of his quotes. Age changes can occur in only two fundamental ways. By purposeful program, driven by genes, that was what he was big on, or random accidental events, you know, mutations, car wrecks, stuff like this. It's a cornerstone of my biology that purposeful genetic program drives all biological processes that occur from the beginning of life to reproductive maturation. This is important. Most of this stuff really only matters till you're at your and above your reproductive years. And then Mother Nature and God and everybody else, they don't care after that, right? We'll talk about that. I shouldn't have said that. I'm a good Catholic boy. Entropy explains aging, genetic determinism, and longevity. And uh, genetic determinism explains longevity. We saw that one. However, once reproductive maturation is reached, so if you get to reproductive age where you can have children and pass on your genes, thought is divided with respect to whether the emerging aging process is a continuation of the genetic program, because really, evolution doesn't care at this point, do they? Except that they don't want you hanging around too long, because you're going to eat the food your kids should be eating. Remember, we were all hunter-gatherers not too long ago, we to 10,000 years ago. So is the gene still telling the story? Or is it continued uh, genetic programming, programming, or is it accumulation of you know, antioxidants, losses? And like everything else in modern day, it's a combination, right? It's a mixture of everything. Next slide. <coughs> there he is. And there's Leonard at his microscope. Next slide. Post Hayflick. Now, now we're talking about modern times. So generally accepted current viewpoint on aging and longevity is kind of a cop out, because look what it says. Aging is a universal, inevitable phenomenon that affects all animal species. It can be considered to be the product of an interaction between everything, <laughs> genetics, environmental, <laughs> lifestyle factors, that in turn influence longevity, which varies within and between species. And in fact, this is correct, some more than others. It's everything. It's not just nature or nurture. It's all, plus the environment, plus the what, where you grow your wine, plus all this stuff. The cool thing about this is we can intervene as individuals in a lot of these places. Next slide. <coughs> so let's go over this. If you look at the science today, theories of aging, these are the six reigning theories of aging. And again, the real story, these are individual theories, you know, but the real story is it's probably a combination of all of these, right? But let's just spend a moment talking about evolutionary senescence theory of aging. Now, when we talk about these, think for yourself as we go over them, hmm, can I intervene on this one? They're all involved. They're, they're, they're all involved. Can I intervene here? Can I intervene here? Can I intervene here? Can I intervene here? Think about that. Okay, next slide. So the first one, evolutionary senescence. Can you intervene? Think about this. This is the most widely accepted theory of aging if you're just talking about one single theory. Okay, this is the strongest one. While well, earlier Hayfick-like theory attests that evolution favors aging, this theory focuses on the lack of evolution to affect late life traits. So what it's saying is, yeah, evolution and genes are affecting you up through your productive years, and after that, it's kind of craps you. Natural selection is not thought to affect the later stages of life because natural selection operates via reproduction. Does natural selection care about what happens to you after you've stopped reproducing, whether you're alive or not? I don't think so, right? Because there's no selection. You've already bred. You've already passed on your genes. Think about that. So there are two ways we think of longevity and aging. There's the productive place, and then there's the post-productive. Mutations and genetic defects acquired after the reproductive years are not modified by reproductive success. Doesn't that make sense? You've already passed your genes on, right? So the stuff that happens after is not modified. Uh, George Williams labeled this antagonistic pleiotropy, whatever that means. Well, it means this. <laughs> An example of this is the P53 gene, which causes damaged cells to not reproduce and die. In young people, what does it do? It keeps you from getting cancer. What does it do in older people? It probably interferes with the ability of cells to repair themselves. That's not a good thing if you're older. So the P53, if you're younger, it's useful. When you're older, it becomes counterproductive. Kind of cool. So we're really aging and thinking about longevity and Two different areas, the robust reproductive years, and then we're beyond that, and things are different after that. Next slide. So, that first one, K53, 
Can you intervene personally with that? My answer to you would be, yeah, probably. We'll talk about it. The cross-linking glycation theory of aging. <coughs> Can you intervene? Let me tell you what glycation, an older term is glycosylation. This means that if you have too much sugar around, or you have any sugar around, it causes cross-linking and glycosylation of proteins, peptides, amino, all kinds of things that it cross-links and it creates these nasty brown structures that cause whatever that was, an enzyme, a peptide, a functional immunoglobulin, not to work as well. Sugar, and this is a huge factor in aging, okay? We all are glycosylating, and, and what do you think happens with diabetic complications? It's a glycosylation phenomenon. So over time, DNA, RNA, proteins, everything, develop inappropriate, dysfunctional, not intended bonds or links with each other, and with various sugars, such as glucose. There's another reason not to eat sugar. The abnormal links tend to adversely affect the functioning of these proteins. And then, uh, you know, they get broken down. So cross-linked damaged proteins are more resistant to proteases, can persist in the organism with adverse effects. Can you intervene here? Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know that apple that you cut? The one apple you cut and ate in the morning, you ate it, right? Was it nice. The apple you cut in the afternoon, you let it sit on your desk. Do you look at it two hours later? Do you look at it six hours later? It's brown and nasty. Those are what are called advanced glycosylation end products, plus some contribution from antioxidants. But just let me tell you that. Next slide. <coughs> Oxidative damage. We, we know, every, we're all here in kind of biology. You know, free radicals, oxidative damage, that's why you take your antioxidants. <coughs> Normal, all the metabolic processes of the cell. You can't eat, you can't survive, you can't live without production of oxidative byproducts. You know, superoxide, uh, free electron uh, uh, agents. And they cause, you know, damage to, just like glycosylation end products, to proteins, peptides, everything. And our body is pretty well suited to taking care of those, cleaning them up, you know? So, normal metabolic processes uh, produce free radicals. It's a, it's a byproduct of being alive. Uh, but you have repair mechanisms. Well, the body's natural antioxidant mechanisms do function to mop up these damaging byproducts. They tend to accumulate over time to cause damage. Tinko uh, knows all about these reactive uh, oxidative products because he deals with ionizing radiation and it creates explosions of oxidative products that kill cancer cells. Fruit fly studies have pointed to oxidative damage as a direct and substantive cause of aging. It's clearly, in us, mammalian is a huge cause. Cumulative established oxidative damage uh, is not repairable. Once it's established, so clean it up while it's happening, repair the early part of it, the rate and extent can be modified. Oxidative damage clearly shown to be involved in all of these. And another way to look at this is it is closely related to inflammation. We all know now that all disease, maybe even mental, certain aspects of mental illness, are linked to inflammation. Inflammation is bad. That's the modern day thing. So can you intervene here? Who doesn't tell their mother to take antioxidants? Who doesn't tell people to eat bright colored vegetables, all those advice things you're getting? Those have antioxidants in them. Healthy lifestyle, exercise, and all these other things helps your repair <coughs> mechanisms work better. Don't eat stuff that's loaded already with oxidative products, you know? Next slide. So, you know what we know with this is you got a stable electron orbit, and then you kick off an electron, becomes unstable, then it damages stuff. Ionizing radiation, this Dinko did this here. And then uh, some byproducts. Uh, pollution, uh, UV radiation, all lead to destruction of essential things, DNA, RNA, proteins, lipids, all kinds of things. Uh, so you have the antioxidant here, um, and then the antioxidants, you know, you know, the traditional ones are vitamin C, vitamin E, uh, they're all alpha lipoic acid, there are a ton of them, help to mop this up before it does damage. So you take antioxidant pills, I sure as hell do, I mean, next slide. <coughs> There's the apple. Now, what did we put on here? We blocked glycosylation plus put antioxidants. You just spray some lemon juice on that, and on this side we didn't. See this? 
this is your DNA, your RNA, your lipids, your peptides, your enzymes. These cross-linking byproducts are un undoable, they're irreparable once they happen. So get sugar out of your life in a big way and <coughs> don't do things to create more of an oxidative environment in the body and because it's going to happen anyway to a low level, do something that cleans up those antioxidants. And what happens? You're going to live longer, theoretically speaking, because it's a major, major contributor to the aging and longevity. <coughs> Next slide. <coughs> Genome maintenance theory of aging. Now, this is purely genetic, okay? Now you're going to say to yourself, ah, I can't do anything here. We'll talk about that. <coughs> this focus, and it's very important, focuses on mutations, damage to the DNA, somatic or non, germ cells mean the ones that are, you know, reproductive cells. Damage can be used by replicative, oxidative damage, all kinds of damage, um, release to early death of cells, and it really focuses on damage to, uh, to um, uh, damage to mitochondrial DNA. Mitochondria, that's the, that's the, your mitochondria in your cells, that's your 300 horsepower V8 thing with its transmission. That's your powerhouse. That gives you your energy. That's how you do what you do. So it's mitochondrial damage, and you certainly don't want that. Um, mitochondrial damage is thought to be a central factor in senescence and aging. Now, can you interfere here? I'm sorry, I, I, I misspoke a little bit. It's not purely genetic, but <coughs> can you interfere here? Sure, you protect the mitochondria by getting rid of these, this oxidative stress up here. Um, next up. Now, here's the one that, that uh, I was talking about. This is purely genetic. This says this is going to happen no matter what. So think about all the other theories. We've, we're down to theory six, the last. The first five, or maybe we're at four. The first ones, we can intervene in a big way. And I'll show you why we know you can intervene. This one is genetic. So we have, cells do have a kind of a hay flake limit. It, it's more complicated than that. But, <coughs> and the modern science points to the telomeres. The telomeres are the caps at the end of each chromosome. And they're the limiting factor. Those telomeres... Here's your long chromosome, it sticks out like this, at the end of the telomeres. And what happens? As you get longer, farther and further through life, and the chromosomes divide more and more, those telomeres shorten. Shorter telomere means less longevity. Longer telomere means more longevity. It's purely genetic. <coughs> Very important. Before a cell divides the chromosome, so it's double. Each offspring gets a full genetic copy. With each doubling, the telomeres are not fully replicated and are short, kind of like the Hayflick limit, right? So when a cell's telomeres reaches a critically short length, usually after 50 doublings, this is about certain different in, in vitro uh, cell lines, so don't, make that, don't think that result uh, means you. The cells stop dividing. So those telomeres get shorter the reproduction of those cells becomes less efficient and at some point it stops. These non-dividing cells with short tel telomeres are senescent. Senescent just means old, worn out, done. Do you think you can intervene here in this purely genetic process? Next slide. There they are, here's the chromosomes. These yellow things are the telomeres on each end of the <coughs> chromosome. And don't do it, I'm not doing it, but there's, you, know, like, you, know, you can do all this genetic stuff, there's no place where you can send your blood up and see how long your telomeres are. Creepy. Oh Don't do it. Right? <laughs> Next slide. <coughs> this is hard data. Telomere. Modification of telomere length. And in small animal and <coughs> worm studies showing that in fact it works. Check this out. I'm sorry. Astral, astragalus. It's a plant product. Blah, blah, blah. It just basically says it reduces the decrease in the telomeres. Omega-3 fatty acids. Fish oils. Has anybody ever heard of fish oils <laughs> in 2015? Sure. Modifies your telomere shortening in a good way. Is that a stunner? Telomere shortening is all over the uh, uh, longevity literature. Antioxidants. 
That's easy. Walmart, Walgreens, good food. Vitamin D, you know, we're all over vitamin D today for a really, really, really good reason. Vitamin D is your best friend. If you haven't been paying attention like I have, I got great vitamin D levels only because I paid attention knew about it. Everybody's deficient. Because look where we live. Yeah, especially up here. I don't care if you go out and garden, you know, a few hours, everybody's deficient. Check your vitamin D. <coughs> it's linked to so many things, it's not even funny. You want to do yourself a favor, don't do anything else, get your vitamin C like uh, D check and get it up to high levels. I mean, to acceptable levels. Uh, don't just take it. Oh, I know it's okay. I'm okay because I take 1,000 units a day. If you're deficient, you're going to have to do that thing where you take 50,000 units once a week, eight weeks, recheck. The, you're going to have to do that catch-up thing. You're kidding yourself if you say, oh, I take one, I take five, and I'm okay. Wrong. Because you're probably deficient, and you really <coughs> have to boost it up. And then you take your one to 5,000 a day. Folate, B12, nicotinamide, B vitamin. Anybody heard of the B vitamins? Modified telomere length. Multivitamins. Now, this is a little controversial, but not really. Um, multivitamin, multimineral. Ginger root. Ginger is a stunning supplement. Stunning. Uh, alpha tocopherol, that's vitamin E. And acetylcysteine. Take it or not take it. You, know, you give it to your lung people. Red rice yeast. Normally we think of this as a naturopath. It's a natural plant statin. The naturopaths give it to their people with lipids, and you don't get muscle problems, and you don't get liver problems. So why don't we all do this? But it infuriates Sandoz and Burles Welcome and all these guys. And do you think Lipitor, Crestor, and those other things modify your telomere length? They do not. It's only this natural product right here. So the point is, the toughest theory of aging I don't know, I can't do anything about this, this genetic thing with the telomeres. I do a lot. And it's proven. You don't have to you don't have to you know prove it yourself. So you can modify in all the areas for increased longevity. Next slide. <coughs> now, oh here's the last one. Neuroendocrine theory of aging, can you intervene? Now this says, let me just tell you quickly. We have a lot of hormones. This says that Mother Nature has genetically programmed us to have the testosterone, the estrogen, the progesterone the thyroid and everything worked great. And then we get beyond those reproductive years, right? Then they all begin to poop out. And they kind of, look at the Google charts, uh, like in uh, North America, or any male, what happens over the years? Well, you got all this robust stuff. And we're not just talking about testosterone. It all begins to poop out, including the thyroid. Do you know the, forget sex, forget sex. Testosterone is so important. It's important in immunology, it's important in cardiac function. I mean, testosterone, not just for men, but for women. So in a man, when that begins to poop out, again, sex aside, what about your heart? What about all these other things? So is it programmed by Mother Nature, or God, or whoever? And it looks like it all works great until you get to a certain age beyond the reproductive years. When as a hunter-gatherer, you were kind of done. You weren't much good out in the battlefield or anything else because you're too slow, you're too old. And then it all poops out. And when those things begin to unravel, you get medical issues. Okay? Is it modifiable? You're right. Everybody heard of bioidentical hormone therapy? Very controversial topic, right? But it's I think it's a real deal. It's now there's a lot of evidence based literature. If you do it, you've got to be very careful. You've got to find someone who's a valid practitioner and knows what they're doing. But you can modify here. Prison. Yeah. It, it's almost like your sex glands, your Gonads are the master glands, really. Yeah. They're signaling your brain, you know, when senescence is kicking in. Uh, <coughs> nothing instead of the other way around, which is the way we usually think about it. That like, you know, okay, this guy's testosterone is dropping off, so he's on the way out, so there's no sense wasting time on yeah. repair mechanisms. And so if you can boost those synthetically, you can fool yes. your the rest of your system into thinking that you're still in good. Absolutely. Area. You know what the bioidentical hormone people do is they look at that, they look at, they take a, a male who's 60 and on that side of the curve, and they say, well, what are these, what does the profile look like when it's a male who's 25? And they begin to slowly reapproach that. Uh, and it makes a huge difference. I mean, it's just tiny. And some of the big people in longevity research now, and if you don't think there's hundreds of millions, and hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars in longevity research, don't kid yourself. What's the pill you're going to do anything to buy? The longevity pill. 
and it's right around the corner. I mean, really, you don't think there's a lot of money in this? Huge, huge. <coughs> so, this is a big, big player. And, you know, like they said, it is a combination. Right? It's a combination. So, next slide. Uh, unified theory of aging, can you intervene? Uh, there's no unified, it's a mixture of things. Um, all right, now let's talk about a couple of concepts. <coughs> the aging is thought to be most active and progressive in the years beyond ESL. Essential lifespan, this is a little prejudicial against guys like me and Holland. Essential lifespan means all the stuff that happens up to and just over the top of the reproductive years when you're creating kids, raising those kids, formating, and then they're done and they're grown. Now you've ended your essential lifespan. Now you're just like fodder. You're just like, oh, look, there's an old guy. You know, <laughs> so <coughs> that's essential lifespan. And that the ESL is an earlier period of life where longevity and vitality is largely genetically determined in order to assure reproductive success in evolutionary Darwinian terms. You think that organism is protected? You think that 25-year-old, 30-year-old, 15-year-old is taken care of? Antioxidant repair, strong muscles, fleet on his feet. You think he's watched after by Mother Nature so that he reproduces and mixes mm -hmm. the gene pool? You bet. That's why Dr. Hall and I don't get into fistfights with 25-year-old guys. You know? Pull a gun out. <laughs> I just run. He pulls a gun out. So, during the ELS, the MRS, maintenance and repair system, this is what I'm saying, they work really well. They keep us healthy and protect us. They work really well. Now, what happens when you get to the end of the ELS? What happens to these MRSs? They're programmed. They just begin to poop out. They don't work as well. So you age faster, okay? And beyond the ELS, the MRS begins to deteriorate. We age. So the ELS is your warranty period. And really, you know, it's kind of, it's kind of, what is it? It's kind of 30-ish, kind of, you know, 30-ish, 40, you know, it's kind of in there. Next slide. So here we go. Let's look at this. Optimal, remember, because we're reproducing here, we're mixing the genes. Optimal repairs. Genetically determined. Here it's kind of whatever happens, you know. Genetically determined. you got a warranty. Got a warranty. Here, and you're, you're in your reproductive, that's important for the species, extremely. Here, look at this guy. Cross-linking, all these nasty things, oxidative stress that aren't getting repaired by this here, because this is suboptimal, if at all. Genetic damage, hay flake limit, all these things are ganging up on this guy. Because remember, <coughs> we're modern. Our, the vast, vast, vast majority of Homo sapiens sapiens life was not spent here in a room with technology, it was spent hunter-gathering. That's how we, that's what we're supposed to be doing. We're not doing it, that creates problems, but that's what we're supposed to do, that's what we're built for. So you get to this age, <coughs> they let him have a few years, because he's wise, to give a little advice to the young hotheads, right? You know, that's, that's what he's there for. And then he goes because he's gonna eat up the food that otherwise other people would need. He's going to be a burden because he can't. We got to run from this hostile tribe. Well, he moves to them slow. Next slide. So now let's talk about intervening. We know that we can intervene everywhere. That's cool. It's encouraging. So what are the studies? There's lab studies. A lot of these, and I want to talk about one in particular. It's one of my favorite organisms. I've never worked with it in research, but 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 I, I'm going to get some. You can get some and get some at home. And observations in nature, anthropologic studies. These are really cool, right? These are lifestyle issues. So let's go forward. <coughs> I don't know how to pronounce this. Never did. I've heard it pronounced. This is this, what they call, I have a couple of friends who are at the NIH who do C. elegans work. This is the C. elegans worm. Here he is, start to finish. He's only like a millimeter long, he, she. Um, and they only live for like a, few, a couple of weeks or something. But they share a lot of homology with our genes. And, you know, we now have longevity genes. We've identified the <laughs> microbiologists have identified genes that have to do with longevity. How long are you going to live? How long are you not going to live? When are you going to die? You can turn them on, turn them off, mess with them. Where do you, how do you think we found them? In, in the amount, 35% of this genome is shared with us. And those longevity genes are in there, the part that's shared with us. So we now know about longevity genes in human beings. Is that cool? 
It's way cool. And the reason we know so much is because these guys are born and die with like short period of time so we can do all this study. And we can put things in their environment and say, are you going to live longer or less? Next slide. So, you, you, you can order these and grow them at home and do your own experiments. You care at me, shares uh, molecular characteristics with the higher organisms. 35% of the C. elegans has human counterparts. We share a bunch of genes with them, okay, like we do with a lot of other life forms and their longevity genes in there. We figured all this out. Um, it's easily, it's an easily sequenced, it's se the genome sequence, and you can manipulate it very easily, go in there and modify things. Lifespan of two to three weeks. Who, what researcher wouldn't love a lifespan of two to three weeks for a model to test out medicines and stuff? Ease of culture in petri dishes in the laboratory. Small, one millimeter, free living, easy to, you feed it E. coli. You throw some E. coli stuff in there, put the, and they swim around and eat the E. coli, and they're happy, happy as clients. Uh, sexually, it's weird, they're all in methodites or something, I don't know. But it doesn't bite, you know? <laughs> like the baboons we used to use for hepatitis studies. Next slide. So here's, here it is. Here's a you know, thing, and here's an adult, and, and here's a you know, mini sailor deal. Modifiable lifespan. You can increase it by and modify it by tenfold. So you put stuff in there. I, you know, you think about it. You ionize your radiation, vitamin D, this, that, the other. Change the environment of the C. elegans worm and see how long it's going to live or not. Or all these things. They've done tons of this. But you can also go in there and mess with the genes. At least ten longevity-related genes, which you think the drug companies are interested in these right now, they're all over them. That, that live long and prosper pill is right around the corner. I'm just telling you, it's true. Uh, some of these longevity genes we share. Food restriction studies, you've heard about this. Eat less, longer lifespan. Huh? Not eat less like in the gutter in Calcutta, you know, poor person, but 50 to 80 percent less and you, you do better. Nutrient modification similarly translates into altered lifespan. So we have gotten so much information about longevity from this bug, this worm. Yeah. Because he's got a lot of characteristics that we do. And those are the characteristics we'll modify. Next one. <coughs> so here's a Petri dish. Here's the little, you put this, you grow up some E. coli and you squirt a few cc's of that gunk in there. Put a little moist soil from your backyard in there. And you dump in some, and they'll live. And you look at them under the <coughs> inverted microscope. See, here's a little path you can follow. And this is all the E. coli, it's a scanning electron microscopy. Here's a little E. coli bed. See the little pathways? And there, there's that guy. There, here's this guy. Here's this guy. They're moving around. Next. There they are. Aren't they cute? <laughs> this is the inverted microscope. So you put, you can do your own studies. You can put stuff in there or modify it. You temperature, whatever you want. It's a great, great science school project, actually. I mean, science, science fair projects. Uh, and then you can watch them and you count how many are alive and how many are dead. You know how they tell they're dead? They don't move. <laughs> It's easy to count. <laughs> Next slide. Observational studies, select human populations. Now, this is kind of the fun part, and there are a couple of really good books. One in particular I'll recommend you buy because you'll find it fascinating. Let's go around the world and see who lives longer and who lives not so long. It's been done. It's fascinating, these little cultures. Of, so you look for long-lived populations, and what do you do? You look at their genetics, their diet, their environment, their wine how much exercise they get, their social interactions, you look at every aspect of their life, right? And then you draw conclusions. So you correlate with laboratory. Well, um, then you choose interventions. Next slide. So long-lived cultures. I'm giving you a sampling. Sardinia, off the coast of Italy, in the Barbaccia region. They live a long time and they keep farming and lifting heavy stuff and they're 98 and they're 104 and they're Still drinking and partying, and they're, excuse me, they're sexually active, and they're robust. Uh, so they went in there and studied everything about it. Some of the healthiest wines, red wines you can buy, you know, the stuff, the only red wine we drink? Cananao Sauvaggio from Sardinia, because it's got all those anthocyanins and all that, all that other stuff. Okinawa, we, I, most of you heard about that. What's his name? Uh, Vernon West, the West Foundation. He did some of his work in Okinawa. They live a long time. Loma Linda, San Bernardino Valley. Hey, look, we've got something. <laughs> Seventh-day Adventists, just like Ben Carson. They have healthy lifestyles. You know, in our small town of Sheridan, 
we got a little store that my wife goes to, and that's the Seventh Day Adventist store where they sell healthy stuff, fresh stuff, healthy stuff. They're very big. Are any Seventh Day Adventists here? They're very big on healthy lifestyle, healthy eating. Costa Rica. So, so it's not all genes because this is a mixture of people. This is the commonality. They follow these healthy practices and they live long. Costa Rica, Central America, several of the Greek islands. It's not Simi, but it's another one. That's got, all it has on it is some uh, um, <coughs> Greek Orthodox churches. And these guys, it's steep and they're going up and down and hauling water and doing all this stuff and taking care of the animals. Yeah, they live into their, they all live into their 90s and some of them easily live into their hundreds. And they're still preaching and hauling uh, water and doing all that stuff. Uh, I don't know how to pronounce that. They call it Europe's village of eternal youth. Hunza, <laughs> northeast Pakistan, that's another one. Where do you think the myth of Shangri-La came from? Shangri-La, you know, you go there and you live forever. It's because those people live a long time. Bama, southwest China. There are actually uh, several different regions in China, about three or four. Next slide. <coughs> Read this book. This is a fun book. Dan Bootner, The Blue Zones. Nine lessons for living longer. And we're wrapping up here. What time is it? Perfect. Uh, this is a cool book. So next slide. I'm going to tell you what these nine lessons are. Now, we're forgetting about the antioxidants and stuff like that. There's a lot you can do. You can take supplements and stuff. Move naturally. They don't recommend weightlifting and marathons, walk, garden, cycle, physical activity. Regular physical activity, <coughs> not sitting here, you know. We should all be standing, actually. You should be standing. At Google, they use stand-up desk. If we have a lecture or meeting like this, they're standing up. And they're kind of moving around like this. So move, 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 move. And you don't have to run for marathons. In fact, marathons are, frankly, unhealthy. Thank you. Uh, know your purpose. Ben Carson's mother, when she got up in the morning, you read that story of his mother, you read that story, that'll make you cry. She got up in the morning, she couldn't read or write. She didn't have any money. Her husband had taken off years before. She woke up with a purpose. These boys are going to get an education. They're going to be contributing citizens. They're going to be successes. You get a purpose. Okay? You can have several purposes, but have something. Don't randomly wander through life. If you don't have a purpose, get one. Kickback. <coughs> Isn't this nice? Everybody loves this one. We should put this at the top. <laughs> Reduce stress, pray, mindfulness, napping, games, socializing. You're not going to live as long as if you don't. If you're all work and no play and you're letting, you can have a high stress job. That's great. I mean, that's stimulating. But you better have your outlets and make sure you take time with it. Uh, now, this is all data. This isn't just nice advice. This is hard scientific data that comes from looking at populations. What are common, the nine common things in all these cultures? Here they are. These are the strong factors. Not all the other things like what kind of water did they drink and how steep are the mountains they climb and was it the atmosphere? Was it their genes? Not really. It wasn't their genes. Eat less. Oh, this is my worst nightmare right here. Stop your meal when less than 80% full. I, my question is, how do you know you're only 80% full? I mean, you feel that. I guess you feel that, uh, you know, a little bit. of. But eat below satiety. Eat some. I'm a little hungry still, but now I'm stopping. People, you know, the way people do this is they'll have a normal serving, then they'll refuse to eat more than half, and the rest goes in the fridge. They're, they're gimmicks you can use. Uh, oh, listen to this. Based on what was in the news a little bit ago. But it's a fact. Don't eat as much meat. Beans. I'm not crazy about beans, but beans are the cornerstone of all these centenarian diets. Beans. Uh, drink in moderation. Now we're talking... Not more than two, probably one. And what do you drink here? Yeah, it matters. Some red wines you drink aren't worth a damn. Just tell you right now. And then they fill the sulfites and sulfates, which aren't too helpful. <coughs> Have faith. Anybody heard of Herbert Benson? He wrote the relaxation response. I met Herbert Benson once. He's a cardiologist. He's quite old now. He's a cardiologist at Harvard. And he's the director of the Mind Body Institute at Harvard. You know, and, and I'll tell you how Herbert Benson started. He was a young cardiologist at Harvard, smart guy. And <clears throat> he had this patient, came in, and I and, uh, was talking to this patient, this lady, about such and such, and then suddenly there was a noise in the next room, and it sounded like some, and she suddenly went into a huge panic attack. She got rid of tachycardic, oh, and she got everything changed, and her whole physique, she started to sweat and all this. She was having an acute panic attack, precipitated, 
By a noise, it reminded of her of a chi childhood traumatic event. And what did Benson do? He calmed her down, they got her some valium, whatever. What was his, what did he do? And this is like in the, holy cow, the early 50s, late 40s. He said, you know what? The mind is connected to the body. Nothing happened to her other than she had a thought. And that thought turned on her heart and her sweat deals and everything else. He said, there's a huge connection. This is what I'm going to do. And that's what he did for the rest of his life. Early on, they threatened to throw him out of Harvard. What? Are you a kook? Are you a nutcase? No. And now it's the real deal. The studies at Hadassah University, Duke, and Harvard, repetitive, repeated studies, and other universities, showing that if you have a traditional faith practice, and it doesn't have to be Judeo-Christian, it can be Buddhism, it can be uh, Hinduism, it can be... It, it has to be a religious faith. It's non-denominational. But if you have that, you live longer and do better. You get over disease better. So forget the God thing. I'm not saying that you can't have God or whatever, but if you practice and if you have a religious faith, you will live longer, be healthier, generally speaking, when we're talking about it. It's fascinating. Now they also looked at aesthetic religious practices. The guy who's like a monk, and he goes, he's very religious, right? He worships all this stuff, but he goes and lives in a cave for 20 years. You think he has that advantage? No, because this is linked also to community. Uh, it has to be community, it has to be regular activity, but it has to be faith-based. And, and so, and the Mind Body Institute at Harvard and Duke have done other studies. And this will freak you out. They've done the studies which are positive studies saying, what if you're praying for somebody? And what they did show is that if you're praying for somebody and they're aware, they get better faster out of the ICU or whatever it is. I mean, this is like going into strange places. It's really cool. The question of, and I went to one of those conferences and listened to the audience. You talk about some pissed off people in the audience. You can't say that about God just because somebody else isn't being prayed for. He's going to give. And, and Herbert Benson is trying to say, ma'am or sir, I'm not saying anything about your concept of God. I'm just telling you what the data show. Okay? So, uh, power of love. This doesn't surprise anybody, does it? Putting family first and keeping older relatives nearby. It's what we used to do. You know, we all were farmers. Grandpa died at the home, you know. We took in the spinster ranch. She got old in our house. I mean, you know, the house was multi-generational. Everybody fit in. But family first, love. You need love in your life. You, know? you need, it doesn't have to be, it can be close friends or relatives or whatever. But, and again, this is not feel good at all. I think you should do this. This is data. This comes from data from studying thousands and thousands of people who live longer who doesn't. You get common things in those people that live longer. And this is totally separate. You can do this, totally separate from the antioxidants, which you can also do. And then stay social. Network of Here's the focus, they say. Stay social. But those network of people, do you want the negative, sarcastic? No, your network of people need to be, they need to have the same healthy habits you do and believe in the same healthy things you do. Okay? Next slide. Now, here's another one, Sally Beer's book. And Sally, she's like, she goes on and on and on and on. She never stops. But let's quickly run through these. This, this is her list. Uh, e below sedati. Five, seven, three, so that's, we know that's good. I don't like the whole thing. So I'm, I'm not big on that. Sprouted breads, use hemp. I don't know what that's about, whether she's smoking it or not. And meat is a treat. That means don't eat much. Meat is a treat. Proper meat preparation. Cheese. She likes to eat. Beans. It's there. Good fats, fish, we all know, omega-3s, nuts. And this is good. Nuts have all kinds of good stuff. Olive oil for eating, coconut oil for cooking and eating. We do this at our house. We put this on, uh, when we eat, we use coconut oil and olive oil. And when we cook, we use coconut Next slide. Uh, garlic and onions, yeah, it's all healthy. Salad of the day, sweet potatoes, no surprise. I don't know what her deal is with apricots, but she's looking at it. Berries, of course, tons of antioxidants. Friendly, but I'm huge, you know that. You came to my probiotic talk. Uh, this is, you know, uh, soy is very controversial. You better be careful about soy because it'll give men breast and do all that kind of stuff. You be careful about soy. Fermented soy products probably have a benefit, mainly because of the probiotics. But you have to be careful with soy, and I, I can't tell you much more about that. 
Magical mushrooms. She <laughs> might be a party girl, you know? <laughs> Between the uh, mushrooms and well, the other weird habits she had in the previous slide. Anyway, I don't know much about mushrooms. Uh, herbs, look at this. Turmeric, which has curcumin. This is turmeric, curcumin, which is the activating of turmeric, is one of the most remarkable herbs on the planet. I I'm not going to talk about it now, but I take it. Uh, no added salt. Go organic. This is very important. We know that a lot of the processed foods are bad. You chew and chew some more. This this is very good. This is old-fashioned great-grandmother advice. You know, chew your food 50 times or this. This is actually very important. I don't remember all the rationales, but less oxidative stress. Next. <coughs> Avoid the pain. Obviously, get rid of the red rice, pasta, potatoes, sweets. Get rid of the sugar. <coughs> A glass of red wine with dinner. We'll come back with that. Tea. Tea's great. Big water. I don't know about that. Uh, combined foods. This actually is non-functional. You know, our hunter-gatherers didn't do it because they didn't have it available. You don't combine protein and high glycemic index carbohydrates. Spring clean your body, she's getting weird again, you know. This is good stuff. I, I, I'm, I'm sure it's good, but I, you know, most juices, if they're fruit juices, are high glycemic index, which is not a good thing. Supplement, yeah, huge, huge, huge. We talked about exercise, huge, huge, huge. Daily dose of sunshine, that's vitamin D. Yeah, and this, exercise your memory and faculties, learn new things. This is very important. Uh, breathe deep and hum. She's been smoking hemp again. <laughs> Meditate and constantly practice mindfulness. This, I guarantee you, will do better and live longer. <coughs> Participate in a community religion. And again, I talked about Herbert Benson. All you can Google all this and look at it. Laugh it off and laugh some more. Next, sing in the shower. Help others. Help others. The practice of gratitude, which you see in certain mindfulness. The practice of gratitude and the practice of helping others is a very positive thing, lowers cortisol, epinephrine. It's a healthy thing to do. I mean, uh, get married or get a dog. We can debate that, you know. I mean, we can split the room up and stuff. But invite a friend. Avoid the standard American diet. We all know that. Sleep, important. Fast. I, I would love to give a round back just on fasting. Fascinating literature. Fasting. Huge. Amazing. Uh, grow your own, right? Organic. And then be a precipitating member of your local community. This this was huge in those nine, you know, those cultures. They're all integrated in their community. They're not just sitting there. You know, when we lived in, we were years in Washington, D.C. at the NIH. And Washington is such a fascinating city, but it's such a sterile place. Because your neighbor, he, she's there for a couple of three years, and then they're off. You live there, you try to make friends. You make a friend and they disappear, or they're too busy because everybody works their tail off in D.C. It is not, that's not a healthy thing. Next slide. Uh, so, quick thing about the red wine. Six characteristics of red wine. <coughs> low uh, low uh, alcohol content. Now, you didn't know that. You don't need the buzz from the red wine. That's not what's helping. Although maybe calming it down a little bit helps. Choose dark red wines, high in anthocyanin, kedizera, tanat, all these uh, various types. Higher the tannin, which gives you the bitter taste, the better. They're antioxidants. Choose dry, carbohydrate-free wines. A dry red. Ask for a dry red. And get this. 90% of the anthocyanin is lost after bottling uh, fairly soon. So you want young ones. This vintage thing, oh, it's older, it's better. You know, those cultures in Sardinia and elsewhere, they make their own wine and they drink it. They make it, they bottle it, and they drink it. They don't have it sitting around forever. Why would they, right? They're make your own. That stuff they drink is younger. So make your own red wine at home. Um, choose high acidity wines, pH less than 3 by 2, anthocyanins better preserved. So what would the, and if they had a, a thing, a wine taster expert, put this all together, what would it taste like? It would be like drinking tart, bitter, blueberry, potting soil flavored water. <laughs> I don't even know what that means. I'm not a fan. And then let's not forget about some of it. There are a whole slew of things like resveratrol, a whole bunch of agents that are, that are healthy. Next, next one. You can get one of these charts. This is called the DeLong chart. And map out. You say, well, if I choose something from here or here, that should be a healthier part of the chart. That wine should be healthier. Next slide. Healthiest wines. You can look this up. This is what we drink. It's not very expensive. I think it's 13 bucks a bottle, 12 bucks. Cannonau grapes and uh, from this part of Sardinia. Malbec from Argentina. This is Italian, French, Tuscany. Sometimes it's grapes, sometimes it's area. 
Here you go, Muscadine from North Carolina. And then this is cool, Fit Vit Wine. This is from California. It's California wine, but they did special filtering. They did, they moved extra carbohydrates. They took the nice sulfites and stuff out. So it's kind of an engineered wine, you know? Kind of a modern engineer, kind of a Google wine. Next line. <laughs> Supplements, we already went over this. This is easy. You can't, I mean, I've never taken this. I don't know much about it, but omega, you should all be taking omega-3s unless you're on filming. Antioxidants should be taking, should be taking. <coughs> B vitamins you should be taking. You should be taking. Uh, e vitamins, that comes from the antioxidants. That's a different issue, red rice yeast, but it's not going to hurt you. And ginkgo uh, biloba is another one down there. Next slide. Now, <coughs> don't look at this. So you're probably thinking, oh, uh, uh, okay. supplements don't really do that much, and they're not so great. There's a wealth of data, particularly in, in uh, lab-based stuff, and uh, in vivo small animal models. See, supplements are very powerful. Now, what this is, <coughs> these are rat brains, okay? And uh, this is one, this is one, a series of them. And what they did with these rats, this is a control rat, and the rat wasn't given anything, right? This one was given blueberry. Not a humongous amount, but fed blueberry for a period of time. This one was fed spinach, spinach for a period of time. This one was fed, fed spirulina for a period of time. They went in, it was very well controlled. This is just representative mini studies. They ligated a cerebral artery and then watched the rat have a stroke. You know, they sliced the brain and did it. The stroke area, see this white thing? That's the stroke area. Stroke, 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 stroke. stroke. So let's look at blueberry. Ah, this looks maybe a little bigger, about the same, about the same, same, same. Maybe this is a little smaller. Up here, a little smaller. This is definitely smaller. Here's something here, nothing here. So maybe the blueberry did something in terms of protecting from the stroke. Now the stroke event, it's not just blood flow, it's anti, it's oxidative, all kinds of stresses. Spinach did better. Look at you eat your spinach, like, pop down and you. Look what spirulina did. Is that a stunner? They like that in this goddamn cerebral artery. Spirulina is blue-green algae-like thing that's has it's like the fountain of youth, you know, like vitamin D. There are a lot of studies like this. You don't think you can do something by intervening in a simple way? You know, you can buy spirulina at Walgreens or Walmart. You know who takes it? I take it. Go ahead. One thing you, that hasn't been mentioned here is uh, uh, minerals. Uh, Absolutely. The folks I who live, live the longest in the world are in Georgia and the Caucasus. They live routinely to 120 years old. Now they also were farmers and they yeah. have fields until they're well over 100. But uh, their min the mineral content in the soil there in Okinawa and a few yeah. other places, high in all those trace minerals that have long since been leached out of the top soil. Food, yeah, your, foods, your commercialized food stinks. Your apples, your tomatoes, I mean, come on, they're all just... You're absolutely right. And when I, when I say vitamins, what I'm talking about is multivitamin, multimineral. And the better ones, the ones, you know, you buy like one a day, one a day. I wouldn't even mess with it. I'd go to a health food store, get some good advice. Get, you're right, absolutely right. The, the, the minerals are essential, what are called essential minerals. Multivitamin, multimineral, a really good one. And it's absolutely, because that soil, in Sardinia where they grow these grapes, that soil is not, that's normal, good soil. I mean, there's got like goat poo in there and all kinds of stuff. It's healthy, good stuff. You know, our commercial farms, God, they're sprayed with Roundup. And that soil is like sterilized, and I mean it's leached, and you know. <clears throat> but supplements make a huge difference. And you're right, the minerals. I didn't talk about them. there are a lot of things I didn't talk about. I'm kind of giving you the gist. Next slide. Now, so let's talk about some quotes. Then we're done. So, so what is Plato, Plato smart? What does he say? You know what he says here? He says you can't live longer. You know. He says the only way you can live longer. I think this is kind of cool is because you reproduce and your kids take a little part of you along. That's how you live. You, you live through your, you know, your spawn, right? Kind of cool. Next slide. <coughs> now we're done. All right. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, so I'll just hug sleep. The secret of genius is to carry the spirit of the child in old age, which means never losing your enthusiasm. Who, isn't that important? That's key. You give up, you're done. Friedrich Nietzsche. Now, he was a good guy, even though Hitler liked him, so forget about that. When marrying, ask yourself this question. 
Do you believe that you will be able to converse well with this person into your old age? Huh? Everything else in marriage is transitory. Isn't that interesting? I can, I can, I mean, I think of my bride, and I can easily say that, you know, we forget all the other stuff. We can talk and talk and go on forever, right? Confucius, old age, believe me, is a good and pleasant thing. It is true you are gently shouldered off the stage, but then you are given such a comfortable front stall as spectator. You know, you watch your kids, you watch what the world is doing, you watch the news, you go, oh, wow. Uh, Henry Ford, anyone who stops learning is old, very true. Whether it's 70 or 80, anyone who keeps learning stays young. The greatest thing in life is to keep your mind young. That's so true. You know, you want to, you, you better be learning new stuff. Not just learning more of the same old stuff. Like Dr. Holland shouldn't just be keeping up on his pathology and reading about it day after day, month after month. He needs to next year start to learn how to speak, you know, Portuguese. Then after that, how to plant a garden, and then after that, how to, you know, new new hobbies, new new parts of the brain. Uh, Sophia Loren, there is a fountain of youth. It is your mind, your talents, the creativity you bring to your life, and the lives of people you love. That's really huge, the lives of people you love. You don't have to have family, biological family, to love people. When you learn to tap this source, you will truly have defeated age. Super true. And this, this is what those old cultures do. This is what they do. That family community thing is everything for them. <coughs> now, who can tell me? She's beautiful. Who can tell me the secret to her skin beauty other than some genes? You know what Sophia Loren does from her skin, for her skin? All the big people, they'd ask her that question time after time. What does she do to keep her skin stunning? And it is stunning. Is it olive oil? Olive oil. That's mm -hmm. all she ever did. She rubs raw, unprocessed olive oil. Because she said, well, I grew up in Italy. The baby's born. They clean them off, and then they smear them up with olive oil. You know? the, um, older women here were Italian patients. Is that what they do? Over the years, I've asked when they don't mm -hmm. have any wrinkles. Yeah. The two commonalities are olive oil and cold water. Cold mm -hmm. water. Oh, closing the pores. Yeah. Yeah. And then, oh, this is my favorite one. This is Helen Hayes. You know the actress? Mm -hmm. She's so... I. Age is not important unless you're a cheese. <laughs> Which is like, don't sweat it, you know, just take your oxidants and be social. And then George Burns, you can't help getting older, but you don't have to get old. I like that. You don't have to act like whatever old it is. Next slide. Uh, references. Uh, you'll like this book, The Blue Zones. It, it, it's fascinating. And then there's all this. Next slide. And that's it. Any any questions? Look at these guys playing basketball. <laughs> that's me and Holland in another 20 years. <laughs> uh, Give me other. Questions? Google it. Read about it. It's a fascinating thing. But the molecular studies, the gene manipulation, and your pill that's coming around the pike in the next five years, more than one, they're going to be competing pills. They're going to be longevity pills. I mean, they're just going to be modifying genes, upregulating, downregulating. Even right now, there's something available. For, it's mostly women in here right now. Your middle-aged men. Uh, it's called Pro RG9. It's, it's, it's a combination of amino acids, but it's mainly L-arginine. And three three scientists in the 90s won the Nobel Prize. You wouldn't know it. The pharmaceutical companies can't make any money off of yeah. it. But uh, you, you, take, you can get that product, product off of Amazon through Synergy, is the name of the company. It was bought out by Nature Bounty. But they're in the central Utah. Uh, I take it twice a day. It's, it's mixed with the uh, resveratrol, the red uh, wine extract, and vitamin D, and some other things. Uh, they, they all wrote their own books. Titles like No More Heart Disease is about, written by a cardiologist. Uh, it, it, uh, yeah, what's it called again? I I'm gonna look at it. What's it Half of them dropped dead by high blood pressure, undetected. What's it called? Feel over dead. It's called uh, Pro RG9. P R O hyphen A R G I hyphen numeral nine, hmm. uh, and it low, it'll lower your blood, blood pressure. It's, it just it uh, relaxes the uh, smooth muscle in the small arteries, uh, which is where a lot of your blood is kind of pooled. So it opens that up. Your heart doesn't work as hard. Uh, lowers the blood pressure. So um, you know, some of, some of these guys they. 
uh, the uh, hospitals where they worked up, they died or left the staff because they weren't uh, admitting patients anymore. Mm -hmm. They're keeping the patients healthy, keeping them out of the hospital, and it's just it's all the minerals and this l arginine primarily that uh, lowers the blood pressure. So um, anyway, that's and that's out there right now available. So and I use it. You know, I'll, I'll tell you what I take. <coughs> And it, what you should really do, get medical advice. Go to your doctor and say, hey, I want to, you know, what do you think this, you know, <coughs> you know, and then educate yourself. But I take a good multivitamin, multimineral, and there's a bunch of minerals in it. I take high doses of uh, uh, krill oil. And again, don't be on Coumadin, don't be on Plavix. You've got to be careful about all this stuff. I take vitamin D, and I, uh, years ago, jacked up and got appropriate in my wife's mind. Uh, kids have vitamin D deficiency, too. Um, so vitamin D maintenance, astaxanthin, which is a super de duper antioxidant, <coughs> uh, uh, vitamin C, then a um, um, uh, fairly high dose of curcuma. And I think that's kind of what I do. But D is really important. It's a huge. It's a hormone as well as uh, uh, being important for antioxidant purposes. It's a it, it makes you feel better. It, it protects your helps protect your skin. For those of us who are up here at six thousand feet, exposed to more cosmic rays than would be down at sea level, thereabouts, you're getting more oxidative damage from these, these uh, particles that are constantly bombarding us. Plus the UV radiation. We need some extra. To, we need a lot of extra vitamin D on board. So um, three thousand uh, units. Uh, you can get up to like 5,000 unit pills at Walgreens. Uh, I wouldn't stay on that for very long, but uh, at least to get yourself up to healthier levels. Uh, but check with your check with your doc before you start doing these things. You can get does your it matter? D tested. Does it matter what kind of vitamin D? Because I understand there are different kinds of vitamin D. Uh, the D3, D3. Is, is the most active. Uh, Form of uh, D. Okay. And, uh, yeah, and uh, that's that's what's in the Pro RG9. I see. What it's worth. I don't have any, any shares in the company. <laughs> it, but, uh, so you'll get plenty of vitamin D if you, if you use that twice a day. Like I do. Anyway, any other, other questions? Fascinating. Well, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you, Charlene. Any big stuff? Uh, Ross from Southwest Counseling wants to talk to you about the... Right now? No. Oh, oh. <laughs> I was the one that one. That was it. Thank you. Appreciate it. So, I took my it. memory stick back. Thank oh, okay. You. Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Very appropriate for my mom's birthday. 97. Oh, oh, that's magnificent. Oh, that's wonderful. Wow. I don't know. Sure. You just had a patient. Upstairs over the weekend, there was 92. Really? And she said her secret to longevity was lots of friends and social. Well, see, that fits right in, doesn't it? Yeah. So, yeah.